Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. We are in the third week of Ramadan and uh, I'm your host Muqtadar Khan and as part of the Ramadan special I'm doing a series of books that I considered are classics from Islamic civilization. Uh, in the past two weeks I have covered Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah uh, and Ibn Rush's Fasl al-Maqal. I'm very heartened to see the response. Uh, they have been viewed more than my average views uh, for my show. So thank you very much for watching and supporting conversations. Uh, and also don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, and make sure that you share this video with your friends because not many people are talking about this book that I will talk about today. And I'm surprised uh, as to why, because it is such an incredible book. It's actually a novel uh, written sometime in the 12th century by an Andalusian philosopher called Ibn Tufayl. And Ibn Tufayl incidentally happens to be uh, the teacher of Ibn Rushd, uh, the author or Averus, as he's known in the West, uh, the author of Faslul al Maqal, the book that we covered last week. So today I'm going to talk to you about this book. It's called Hay Ibn Yaqzan. The literal translation of Hay ibn Yaqzan is uh, a life, son of the awake. Uh, I like to translate it as simply as the life of Hay, uh, but it actually means Hay is uh, alive and his son of awake. Uh, obviously, Ibn Tufail wanted to uh, attach uh, some metaphorical uh, meaning to the terms, but uh, a few centuries before the famous uh, Central Asian uh, Islamic uh, doctor, philosopher, uh, uh, and mystic Ibn Sina, who's also known very well in the West as Avicenna, Ibn Sina had written a trilogy of novels, uh, and the first one was called Hay Ibn Yaqzan. Uh, I have not read the first one by Ibn Sina, but commentators on this book, Hay Ibn Yaqzan, uh, by Ibn Tufail say that the story was very different. Uh, uh, I mean, the issues that Ibn Sina was addressing were quite different from the ones uh, that uh, uh, Ibn Tufail was addressing. So first of all, who was Ibn Tufail? Ibn Tufail was a philosopher, a, 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 a doctor, uh, uh, and uh, he was in the court of the caliphs uh, of Andalusia, the Islamic Spain. He was in Cordoba most of the time. Uh, uh, he was with Abu Yaqub Yusuf, the, the caliph who later on also patronized Ibn Rushd. Uh, he was the teacher of Ibn Rushd and he introduced Ibn Rushd to the caliph uh, of the al muhad dynasty in Andalusia. Uh, not much is available about uh, Ibn, Ibn Tufail's writing except this book, I found this book uh, called Falsafa al Ibn Tufail, and for those of you who are Arabic readers, you can buy this. This is like an annotated bibliography of uh, his work or the kind of things that were philosophically interesting to him and the stuff that he wrote about. Uh, but uh, there are apparently many copies and translations of Hay Ibn Yaqzan. I have three and two of them are here. You can see them. These are quite inexpensive ones. I'm recommending this. This costs like six, seven dollars on Amazon. Uh, and I think uh, uh, all young people should should read it at least and also older people because and there are some interesting discussions and I'll summarize some of his arguments that he makes in the book and tell you the story of Hayib Niyakzan. Uh, this book is very fascinating because it is the third most translated Arabic book into various other languages, especially European languages. So the first book that is translated in nearly all languages now is obviously the, the Holy Quran. And the second one is 1001 Nights. And so the third one, which is translated more, is Hayib Niyakzan. So there are... Over a period of 500 years, Islamic philosophers have addressed uh, this concept uh, of uh, 
talking about learning, about knowledge, about epistemology, about philosophy, the importance of philosophy and the relevance of philosophy in uh, essentially a fictional form by talking about an imaginary person and how that person becomes alive to his or her reality by telling a, a story. So, so there was someone else who wrote a book about someone as the perfect person who followed um, uh, Ibn Tufail by a couple of hundred years. Uh, but uh, the, the religious message that he was trying to send was quite different from Ibn Tufail's. So what is the story of Hai Ibn Yaqzan? So Hai Ibn Yaqzan is a person who was, according to Ibn Tufail, either born on an island somewhere in the Indian Ocean, or he was left there like Moses. And he grows up alone on this completely isolated island. Uh, fortunately for him, there are no predatory animals on that. And there is uh, an antelope uh, that feeds him and takes care of him. And so he grows up. Uh, and so Ibn Tufel tells the story of Hai, how over a period of 50 years or 49 years in, in uh, shall we say, intervals of seven years each, how Ibn Tufel essentially, uh, how Hai grows and learns. So he argues that in the first seven years, um, Hai begins to notice the difference between him and his mother and other animals uh, with whom he got an opportunity to socialize. And the, the awareness dawns upon him that he's different from all of them. I mean, the difference is highlighted in his weakness. He's not able to run as fast as others. He's not able to defend himself as others can. And unlike him, others apparently had natural weapons. They had beaks and they had claws and they had nails and they were strong. So Ibn Tufel, in realizing his weakness, uh, also begins to become self-aware as to how he is different. So the first seven years are essentially learning uh, of the fact that he is weak and uh, he's different and he's also unarmed, unlike others. And then subsequently, the second period is a period of empowerment in which he learns to make uh, weapons, learns to make uh, clothes for himself, uh, and then realizes that these clothes that he was basically making from the skins of other animals, uh, etc., gave him power and he was able to scare away other animals, etc. So the second phase is of empowerment. And then the third phase is his life when his mother dies, is uh, one of the the most profoundest periods of learning. And in this, uh, Ibn Tufel uses his medical knowledge to tell us how essentially Hai performs an autopsy on his mother to understand why she stopped moving and why she died. And he, he, he learns a lot of things. He realizes that there must be something at the core of the body uh, that controls the rest of the body and makes the body function. And when this core is destroyed or this critical organ in the body is hurt, uh, it will completely undermine the body. And he realizes that through self-awareness of his own, own heart, and he notices that every time he would get into a conflict or a fight, he would try and protect himself uh, and the special organ of his body in, in his encounters with other animals. So he cuts his mother open, looks through the layers, finds the heart, and then finds that one heart is full of blood. And I mean, one of the the cavities in the heart is filled with blood and the other is not. Uh, and so he realizes that the essence of his mother, the soul or the life who resided in that part of the heart. And so it must have escaped and left the body and therefore. And so he begins to realize that his mother was not this body, but something other than that body, which is unbelievable. So in that sense, he, he discovers the soul uh, and believes that there is, soul has left the body. And so there's this complicated philosophical argument where eventually uh, Hai reaches the knowledge that uh, that Aristotle and later Ibn Rush tried to talk about when they talk about the active intellect, saying that there's only one human consciousness and that human consciousness is achieved uh, 
by some kind of uh, soul or or the mind or the human intellect and so while there are human particularities and bodies there are many human bodies there's only one active intellect and so so ibn tafail makes this argument now this manner of uh, this autodidact character of hayya as he learns by himself uh, was highly appreciated in the west and so a lot of western commentators uh, uh understood uh, this novel as one that advocated reason over anything else and the capacity of human being to learn about the truth uh, through empiricism and, and reason whereas uh high was translated into english in 1708 i think uh, several decades or a couple of decades before daniel d4 wrote robinson crusoe which kind of mimics hay ibn yaqzan uh, in its anguish uh, but nevertheless uh, the fourth uh, 20 part of his life uh, from 35 to 42 uh, he starts thinking of things which are more in the abstract after he understands that there is some thing abstract to existence like the soul as different from the body hay then begins to look at the universe look at the creation he looks at the stars etc and begins to look at things that are out there and so he he makes the aristotelian argument that these are causes and so there must have been an effect or something that must have caused this and so he reaches the uh, the definition of god that aristotle advanced that god is essentially uh, the first cause or the cause without a cause and everything else is caused by this cause without a cause so hay is talking eventually reaches that point philosophically uh, where he understands that this entire universe must have a creator and so he discovers god by way of reason but the last phase is more fascinating uh, where hay realizes that since there is a creator he must worship this creator and so if you listen to the arguments that uh, Ibn Tufail is making they are not philosophical they are quite unlike those made by philosophies it is more like reading <laughs> Ibn Arabi uh, or the Sufis and so ultimately uh, Hay becomes mystical he becomes a vegetarian uh, and tries to live a life of restraint uh, and peace Hay now begins to f- want to connect to this creator and so in his quest for the creator he actually develops rituals uh, by which he expresses his his uh, admiration and worship and love for god and it is very interesting that in this context uh, uh, ibn tufail in this part of life where uh, hay is now in a state of ecstasy and happiness that he has discovered his creator not just discovered that there is a creator but has discovered a way to connect with this creator so through his uh, uh, becoming a, a vegetarian through his worships uh, through his other rituals so there is a famous hadith uh, of prophet muhammad uh, peace be upon him that uh, ibn tufail quotes were bad in, in which uh, this is how the hadith goes abu huraira reports that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i have prayed uh it says that god said that i have prepared for my pious servants which the eye has not and has seen and the ear has not heard and no human heart has ever perceived such bounties and no human mind has been able to conceive of that uh and so he recites the uh, it also is based on the Uh, a quranic verse uh, that you can see i'm citing no soul knows what comfort has been hidden for them so the idea that god has created some special cons- uh, pleasures or sources of joy and happiness and ecstasy uh, for those who worship him and believe in him uh, and uh, and they are things which are beyond human imagination they are not like anything that we have seen or heard Uh, or our heart perceived or desired so that is what a, a standard for sufi definition of fana is
to become one with God. So basically there are two steps. <laughs> in the first step, he's becoming one with the active intellect as the philosophers perceive, but there is a stage beyond that of the philosophers and that is of this, the mystic, the Sufi, who then connects with God and experiences the joys that God has reserved for their best pious. So this is the story of Hai uh, initially, which, which is what is often understood, but there is an, an epilogue to the story. And basically, you could say that Haipni Yagzan is not just a story of Hai, but the story of, say, two islands. So there's another island on which there is a particular sect, which is very pious, which, uh, which has very strong social norms, uh, which believes in the divine law, is very good with strangers and others. And one of their residents uh, realizes that the law and obviously this is referring to the Sharia, but the law also advocates that the individuals isolate themselves from society and, and pursue a higher connection with God. So one of them called Absal leaves that island and comes to the island where Hai is. There he meets with Hai and teaches Hai language. Until now, Hai knew, knew, did not know another human being. And there are interesting ways in which Ibn Tufail describes uh, uh, Hai's struggle to recognize uh, Absal as another human being and recognizing that, oh my God, there's another being that is exactly like me in terms of uh, form. And anyway, so Absal teaches Hai language and then starts teaching him the law and all the wisdom and everything that he had learned from the Quran and from the from the Islamic law, uh, Hai says, I know. I already know these truths, and Hai confirms that he had reached that. So Absal is initially very surprised that this person has reached that stage, which he himself is aspiring for, where knowledge is, is present to him. So Hai has knowledge without the, the revelation that is necessary to reach this knowledge. So some people have taken this part of, of the narration to argue that this is a precursor to Ibn Rush's uh, uh, double truth theory or two sources that both reason and revelation will read the, ultimately the same truth. So basically the end goal is God and you can reach God either through philosophy and the active intellect or you can reach God through revealed knowledge that is coming from Bible, the Quran, the Torah, and other divine revelations like even the Bhagavad Gita. So God reveals these truths to human beings. And so that's how they, they connect uh, with the divine. Uh, and the other way is uh, just through the rational, through the reason, through empirical, through science, and through observation and interpretation uh, of reality. So either you read literally the signs of God that are revealed or read the signs of God that are there in the creation. As Sir Sayyid Ahmed says in India later on, that God has written two Qurans. One is the holy book and the other is the creation. And the signs of God and the work of God or the speech of God and the work of God cannot contradict. And therefore, the knowledge that we acquire from science is not going to contradict the knowledge that we acquire from religion. But anyway, Hai then follows Absal back to his island and tries to preach <laughs> to the people of the island who are quite happy and content uh, in their norms and in the law. They are law-abiding people who respect each other, who like each other, and they have cordial. So even though they don't, uh, they are irritated by Hai's preaching, they reject him. They are kind of repelled by the by what he considers is the ultimate truth. And uh, Hai thinks of them as incapable of learning. He's quite disappointed. And then, so they amicably disagree. They agree to disagree. And so Hai returns to his own island with Absal and they live there in ecstasy, in, in worshiping God and they die. Uh, so this is the story. And there are some typical things that you can take from here. Uh, the argument from Ibn Tufel that uh, truth, the essential truth, existential truths uh, can be acquired uh, through reason. Uh, you can discover God without having to take recourse to a formal religion uh, or institutionalized religion or also via uh, 
re revealed text. Uh, what is also interesting is that, uh, like all philosophers, Ibn Tufail also accepts the hierarchy, an ontological hierarchy, saying some people are capable of acquiring a higher status and others are incapable of reaching it. So the truths that are available to philosophers and the ecstasy and the divine connection that is available for the, to the mystic, to the Sufi, that is not available to ordinary people. They cannot appreciate it. They cannot recognize it and they find it repellent. Uh, it is also interesting that in this era in America, when we talk about vocism and the idea that Hai is basically alive, the son of the awakened or the son of the woke makes the interesting sense. Uh, there are lots of other interesting commentary that I want to give. One of the point is that uh, Hai ibn Yaghzan's achievements, both mystical and philosophical, are without society. And his uh, intellectual achievements are without language. So it raises the question, can we think without language? Uh, I don't know. I know that I can think in multiple languages. Sometimes when I'm trying to confront a philosophical problem, uh, I find that thinking in a different language like Urdu or Hindi uh, or even Arabic, sometimes the words that are available to me in those languages make me understand a situation very differently uh, from, say, in English, because certain words are not there in the English language. Uh, so, so I don't know how Ibn Tufail thought Hai Ibn Yaqzan was able to think uh, without language. Um, that is one question, but he assumes that not only can one think, but can also reach fundamental truths and then be able to recognize it when you have learned the language. So he is able to put in words later once he absolutely teaches him language the thoughts that he had. So he had a memory of his knowledge, his memory of his becoming awake to certain realities, existential realities, and he was able to store that without the help of language, which is uh, very interesting. And in these days of, of cognitive sciences and neurosciences, uh, it would be an interesting puzzle to test empirically. Uh, and of course, the, the idea that without society, without other human beings, without communication with other human beings, without ideology, without a state, how in the state of nature can all these truths be found? Is a society necessary for us to, to realize good life and happiness? Uh, he's questioning that. I mean, he's showing that both is possible. So there's an island where there is society, there is law, there is state, there is a king called Salman who is wise. And people are law-abiding and happy. And then he's talking about an island where there is none of that. And there's a man alone who is also able to even reach a higher level of intelligence, higher of a, a level of awakeness uh, to mystical truths and to celestial truths and divine truths and divine mysteries, and also be happy at the same time. Um, what is interesting to me is that uh, ultimately, the goal seems to be to achieve a profound sense of happiness, happiness which is not just satisfaction through materialism, but also through a vacantness of your mystical and your philosophical uh, faculties. So this is the story of Hai Ibn Yaqzan. Uh, I think it is a brilliant book, uh, especially since it was written in the 12th century, probably around 1170, 1160. Uh, and uh, it is obviously anchored in the arguments of that time uh, about uh, the role of philosophy, the role of science, and the fact that, like his student Ibn Rushd, Ibn Tufail was also a doctor. So, the, so to them, uh, this epistemology is uh, not just uh, philosophical, rational, as we think today, but also scientific. So he's both Aristotelian as well as Neoplatonic, uh, but he's also a Sufi, so he's more like Ibn Sina than Ibn Rushd, and so so you look, you see basically here three epistemologies at work. One epistemology is on that island where all truths and rules and laws are revealed by God, so they are getting 
uh, a blueprint for happiness, uh, both societal and individual. So knowledge is coming through revelation. And then you have Hai, who is demonstrating that capacity for learning the truth first through empirical observation, <laughs> like a scientist. And then once he starts searching for uh, non-empirical and reflecting on metaphysical issues, he starts thinking like a philosopher. So you have a rational philosophy, rational epistemology here. And then he reaches the higher stage where knowledge is coming by presence and connection with the divine. Uh, and uh, there is another tradition where Sufis say that once you reach a certain level of proximity to God, uh, God sees through your eyes and God acts through your hands. So, so there is an awareness and a knowledge that is available to Sufis uh, that is not available to ordinary people by any other epistemological means. So, so I think all the books that are easily accessible, Hai Ibn Yakzan is, it is not very expensive. It is easy to read. Uh, Try to find even Goodman's uh, translation. It is one of the better ones. Uh, and uh, hope you have a, a, are having a good Ramadan uh, and you are able to achieve some of the things that uh, Hai was able to achieve. So until I do next week, when I do another uh, classic book from Islamic civilization, take care, be happy, don't forget to subscribe to conversation like this video press the bell icon and also share it with your friends and social political network i'm your host muhtadar khan